Hello and welcome everybody. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes to make sure everybody who's joined today can finish locking this call. I think we're ready to go. Welcome to this East West Railway Company online public event for the Shelfords to Cambridge and Harton to Hawkston. My name is Claire Keith Anderson and I'm Community Engagement Manager at East West Railway Company. Following the launch of the second round of non-statutory consultation on the 31st of March, this week we're holding the second round of online events or webinars. The focus of today's session is on responding to the questions raised by communities to date. For those wanting more detailed dialogue with specialists from the project team, please attend any of our live chat events. We will start with a quick run through this evening of what we're consulting on in your area, and please do use the Q&A feature to ask us further questions and to post comments. But the focus of this evening's event is on responding to questions raised to date by yourselves. If time allows, we will respond to one or two new questions arising via the Q&A function during the webinar before we wrap up with some next steps. We are holding similar sessions across the whole route between Oxford and Cambridge throughout this week. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to the rest of the team. Joining us today, we also have our Strategy Director, Will Gallagher, our Program Delivery Director, Ian Parker, our Director of Construction, John Worthington, our Program Manager for Collection Stage 3, Paul Sparrow, Head of Environment, Michael Shanks, our Head of Operations, Maria Cliff, our Land and Property Manager, Jorn Pace, and Philip Alliston, a Senior Advisor from our Land and Property Consultant. And behind the scenes, we have James and Hannah helping us. Before we start with the presentation, I'm going to run through a brief housekeeping and Teams Live note. Many of you might be familiar with Teams Live, but just as a reminder, you'll be on moot throughout. You'll find in the bar below the Q&A feature where my colleague has just posted a message. Please note that we are recording these sessions and therefore will not reference any names or descriptions directly if provided in the question for GDPR reasons. That's all the housekeeping we have. I'm now going to hand you over to Ian Parker. Yeah, Claire, thanks for that. Um, so uh, as you kind of introduced me, my, my name is Ian Parker. I'm uh, the Programme Delivery Director for East West Rail. Um, and my job really is to, uh, is, is, is to figure out how to design and then uh, to construct the railway uh, in due course. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce you to this session. Um, it will it's, it, it's the same as the session we, we're running tomorrow. So um, so I know that some people have asked, is it, is it going to be different on each occasion? The answer is no, it's the same session. Um, but thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, it's an hour long webinar. Um, it's going to provide in information about the consultation, uh, address key themes, issues and questions that emerged from the first webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago, um, and then highlight how you can get involved uh, and where to find out more. Um, in addition to this, there are, as you can see down the right here, there are a number of live chat sessions um, which uh, which are going on as well, which is another opportunity for you to um, you to ask us questions directly. Um, in terms of our plan for this evening, um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so firstly, uh, we'll give you a quick recap on what we're consulting about. Um, but the main the main thrust of this session really is to answer your questions. So you've you've written to us uh, with a number of questions and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can this evening. So uh, conscious that you've probably heard some of the the, 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 the basis for the consultation before we're going to we're going to focus on that. Um, and then finally, we'll tell you again how you can continue to get involved and, and, and what's uh, what's happening next. So then, first of all, um, in terms of the, the route that on which we're consulting, you'll you'll be aware, I'm sure, that East West Rail is a proposed new rail link which which uh, connects um, communities between Oxford uh, and Cambridge via Milton Keynes and, and Bedford uh, and a number of, uh, of villages on the way. Um, it's been de delivered in three connection 
stages, uh, the first of which is in construction now, of course, between Vista and Bletchley. Um, and the two further connection stages are uh, from Bletchley to, to Bedford to increase the service or to extend the service as far east as Bedford. And then the, the final connection stage, which will complete the route from Oxford to Cambridge, uh, includes, of course, the section that we're, we're, we're discussing this evening. Um, so uh, that's just a very brief introduction to, to, the, to the scheme. I'm now going to hand over to Maria, my colleague, uh, who's going to talk to you uh, about the, the consultation itself. So, uh, Maria. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Maria Cliff um, and I'm head of operations for East West Railway Company. Um, just very briefly, um, we've we've split the consultation into two sections. Um, the first is really focused on customer experience and railway operations, which I'll cover very briefly in a moment. Um, and then the second uh, main section of the consultation is on our proposed infrastructure development uh, split into six geographic sections. So in relation to customer experience and railway operations, um, we've asked a number of questions um, in the document, which we're really keen to hear your views on. And those range from the train service that we plan to offer in terms of calling patterns and, and stations and colleagues, um, right the way through to how you want information to be provided to you from when you're planning your journey to post journey. Um, so. Uh, we would really love to hear your views uh, so we so myself and my team can continue to to build in everybody's feedback to make sure that we we deliver a railway for you that is based on on customer customer feedback and uh, and, and delivers what you want so thank you very much i will hand over now to will thank you very much maria um so you can see here the you know, the full geographic range of the uh, consultation that we're hosting um, and particularly today's um, webinar is focused on sort of project section E and project section F so they're the double boxed sections um, on the east of the diagram on the approaches into Cambridge but as you can see we are consulting on a full range of infrastructure interventions as well as the customer experience that Maria just spoke about. So if we move on we'll, to the next slide, we're going to have a look at Section E very briefly and then Section F. So Section E is looking at the space from Halton to uh, Hawkston. Um, and this slide just shows you our emerging preferred option as we come uh, sort of down uh, past uh, Hazlingfield, Harston, and then you can see how we join the existing uh, main line so that's the king's cross line you can see the existing line is the red dotted line and what we're proposing is a grade separated junction that moves the uh, line a little bit further south and east uh, so that we can then join uh, the king's cross line uh, in, in that way um, what that does is you know, actually mean we can join the line, you know, in a, in a way that drives a reliable service um, and um, you know, in, ensures that we get, you know, you know a good uh, sort of passenger connection, which is what we're what, which is what we're all about delivering. So that's the that's the main sort of proposal and our emerging preferred option in, in, in this area. If we then move on to section F, which is the Shelfords to Cambridge and moving on to the next slide. Um, there you can see a series of interventions um, where we will be improving or closing the level crossing at Hawkston Road. Then as we uh, head along the King's Cross line to where we join the West Anglian main line, that's modifications uh, to the Shepworth Junction and we're consulting on a couple of options there. You can see then that you know the where the where the thick the two thick blue lines are, we'll be building um, an additional two tracks um, on the both the approach into Cambridge South and then on north into uh, Cambridge itself. Um, you can see that uh, the Cambridge South project is doing a little bit of that for tracking up to the proposed new station there. 
uh, which isn't part of our scope, but the thick blue line is. And then at Cambridge Station itself, um, providing some additional platforms, uh, two additional platforms at Cambridge Station. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time today going through those proposals uh, because they are we've briefed um, you know set pe people on these uh, in the past and they're available in the consultation document because we do want to actually make some progress now um, on um, you know responding to some of the questions uh, that we've been asked over the course of the consultation through the Q and A uh, uh, chat bar where people have been asking us questions in events like these, as well as questions that people have written to us with, and we thought it was worth taking some time today to answer those questions. If you do have specific questions to which you want direct answers, um, I can't stress enough that the live chat events that we are doing, there's between two or three of those every single week between now and the close of consultation. That is the best way to get directly to our experts will be able to answer your sort of personal specific questions. What we're trying to do in these webinars is answer the kind of key questions that have been coming up, you know, it, new, on numerous occasions so we can you know, sort of cover those sort of themes. <coughs> so if we move on to the uh, onto the first one, um, we've had quite a number of questions about the plans for freight. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context on freight, moving on to the next slide. Um, you know, I think it is worth saying that, you know, rail freight can be a quick and sustainable way to carry goods around the country. It does reduce uh, CO2. It reduces congestion on the road. You know, each freight train removes up to 76 lorries from the road. So I think that is worth taking into account. Um, there are, uh, you know, benefits in terms of safety um, and also uh, benefits to both the UK economy and in terms of productivity for the UK as well. So whilst we recognise that there are some concerns around uh, freight, um, we do think it is important just to sort of balance that with a little bit of context about why, uh, you know, rail freight has been, you know, a you know a, a good thing in, in 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 some areas. So if we if we move on to the next slide. Um, really just talking a little bit more about the plans for freight. You know, government has set us an objective to support the existing freight services and also to make provision for potential future demand. We need to um, you know, balance the benefits of freight and the you know, requests that government has made of us with the views of local communities. We understand you know, that people you know, do have some questions about you know, the impact of freight and we're currently carrying out some work to understand both the capacity uh, of the railway uh, to deliver freight and also the demand that we're likely to see and that has a set of considerations at uh, the, the amount of available freight paths that's both on east west rail but also um, on the routes to and from east west rail which are vital to if we're to deliver uh, freight on the railway. So the limiting factor here is likely to be uh, the extent to which freight can get to and from East West Rail. We also know that freight is 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 something that's called open access. So um, the freight industry sort of bids for paths on the railway. So if there isn't demand for freight, then there won't be freight on the railway. So we're trying to understand the likely level of demand. Um, we're trying to understand the cost of the infrastructure that we need to build to allocate to allow for freight and you know additional changes to the rest of the railway network so i've made clear that you know a lot of the things that determine the amount of freight on east west rail won't be east west rail itself but are likely to be um you know the routes to and from east west rail um and also we do recognize that you know where there are impacts for example you know, in terms of noise or those sorts of things, how we the steps that we can take to mitigate that potential negative impact you know, is, is really important as we as we you know, put all of these considerations in the round um, and bring forward proposals for the right thing to do, which is what we will be doing in the next statutory consultation that is coming. So just that was just to give you an idea of the things that we're taking into account. 
So moving on to the sort of specific um, sort of questions um, in, in this area. Um, in terms of, you know, does that mean freight trains will run all night, sort of causing a huge uh, noise impact? Um, I think, as we've said, you know, East West Rail is being designed to maintain current freight capacity, um, as well as looking at the potential for sort of future demand. You know, that's obviously subject to a whole range of things in terms of, you know, the sort of economic conditions, you know, what government policy is, and as I've said before, the effect of interventions elsewhere on the network. So the likely capacity is is affected by um, uh, by uh, by uh, how you get to and from East West Rail. Um, we're doing the work to understand that sort of freight demand. I think one of the key things to say is that we have looked at the um, sort of likely hours of operation, and I think we've published those in the uh, in the documents that are in now in the public domain. And it is, you know, they that doesn't envisage freight running through the night. Um, so I think that I think that is important to say. And then in relation to the noise, um, you know, obviously sort of modern freight services do operate with sort of clean and efficient locomotives, you know, operating within the sort of legislative controls in terms of emission levels and those sorts of things. And also, you know, as we are developing the design of East West Rail, you know, we will need to design in mitigations, you know, for example, you know, in relation to noise impacts, so sound barriers and those sorts of things, which we will design in, you know, that will benefit you know, not just you know, reducing the impact of the freight services, but also the passenger services as well. So in terms of that question, um, we don't really envisage freight trains running all night, and there will be steps that we take to mitigate the noise impact of the railway, whether that's for passenger services or for, or for freight, and we will set that out in, in the statutory consultation that is to come. Maria, why don't I hand over to you for the next one about the uh, sort of freight pass per day? Sure, thank you, Will. And just to follow on from what you just said, um, if anybody's interested in understanding more about uh, the hours of operation, uh, both pass for the passenger service, because we're, we're aiming to provide a what's called a clock face service, so a regular reliable service, uh, that's in the railway operations and customer experience part of the documentation. Um, it is, they are published on page 33 for anybody who wants uh, a little bit more information on that. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm happy to take the next few questions, Will. Uh, so in terms of what is the capacity of the line for freight per day? Um, so as you said, one of the key considerations is the number of available freight paths, and, and we are going to continue to accommodate existing freight. Uh, today on the line, there is freight between Oxford and Vista, um, also between Bletchley and through into Bedford, and um, additionally in the Cambridge area today, uh, which we will provide um, the existing paths. Um, and, and in terms of um, how we provide paths for existing freight, predominantly we are running a passenger service. So we need to look at the spaces in the timetable between the passenger services. So where freight could potentially run that doesn't affect the reliability or risk the reliability of those passenger services. And so my team um, are working uh, closely with, with Network Rail and others to look at our end-to-end -end timetable for Oxford to Cambridge. Um, and, and our primary focus is on passenger services but that will also allow us to see what the potential capacity could be for freight in between those passenger services. Um, that capacity could be enhanced uh, by providing additional sections of track, which are known as passing loops, um, and that makes it possible for passenger trains to overtake freight trains or, or slower passenger trains as well. Um, so we absolutely um, hope to know the, the number of freight paths by the statutory consultation uh, when we next come back to, to talk to you again. 
um, but it is very dependent on on market forces and on government policy. Um, so we're, we're working through those details um, and we will be able to provide you with more information soon. Next question around the forecast for freight demand. Uh, so myself and the team um, are in close discussions with the freight operating companies uh, so that we can understand what the what the future looks like for them and uh, the potential opportunities that East West Rail could provide uh, across the, the, the network. Um, and that engagement will continue um, to help us understand the interest from those freight operating companies in running the freight services on our network. Uh, and finally, um, there are some questions around the number of freight trains um, per day uh, and passenger trains per day uh, that have been advertised. Uh, so it, firstly, I'll start with the passenger services. Uh, so we are increasing the services um, across the connection stages. Uh, and again, there's more information in our uh, consultation document for railway operations and uh, customer experience. So please, uh, please do find that um, it's it's on page 34 of the document um, if people are interested. Um, and in terms of the number of freight trains, well, um, it's very difficult for us at the moment to provide realistic and meaningful figures on that, um, other than to say, as, as we've said already, that existing freight trains will continue to be, uh, will continue to make provision for those. Um, but, you know, we're, we are consulting at a formative stage to get your your views on our on our emerging concepts and our what our approach to freight could be. Um, so please do send us your, your feedback and your thoughts and we will absolutely build those in to um, to how we how we develop and and move the scheme forward. I think it's probably just worth saying, Maria, there that the the question that we'd received, sort of noting fifty freight trains a day and about six passenger trains, I think that implies there are many more freight trains than there are passenger trains. I that that's certainly not something that we that we recognise um, because we are talking about between four and six uh, passenger trains an hour. Um, so I, I don't I don't recognise sort of six uh, sort of passenger trains uh, per per day. Um, so you know we, we do think that the predominant use of the service will be for passenger trains, not for freight trains. That isn't to say there won't be freight trains, but I, I think this the notion that this is primarily a freight railway is it is it just isn't accurate. Um, should we move on to the next uh, section? Um, which I think is the environment, and I'm handing over to Michael, I think. Uh, yes, hi, good afternoon, uh, evening, everyone. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide, probably. Um, it's worth noting that we have um, uh, a number of environmental principles that we're currently working to um, and stri striving to deliver against those particular principles. And what I hope to do in the next couple of slides is give you a a bit of a flavour of some of the activity that's going on in terms of trying to deliver against those principles. So we are striving to deliver uh, a net zero carbon railway. Um, as you may be aware, the UK government has committed to reach net zero carbon by 2050. Um, and also at a more detailed and local level, Bedford Borough Council um, has pledged to become net zero or carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and Cambridge City Council has quite similar uh, net zero carbon aspirations. Uh, and so as a project, we'll need to demonstrate that we don't have a material impact on the ability of government to meet its carbon reduction targets. So this is something we're working really hard on at the moment, and we'll continue to do that um, over the coming months and years through the design of the scheme. Biodiversity net gain is another really important um, aspect for us. Uh, and when we're at this stage really looking to make that achievable by looking to avoid high value priority habitats uh, and we'll look to enhance habitats um, as we move forward through the design process too. Um, under uh, the TWAO, which can, uh, covers the CS1 part of the scheme, we committed to a 10% biodiversity net gain. Um, and in keeping with that and with government uh, legislation as that develops, again, for the arrangement scheme, we have committed to delivering biodiversity net gain. In terms of a sensitive approach, developing route alignments, um, really we're following uh, what we call the environmental mitigation hierarchy. 
So that's about minimising impact, um, mitigating that impact, reducing it and compensating for it. But really at this stage, the focus for us is avoidance. So we're working very hard to avoid the most sensitive environmental and heritage features in the designs that we're um, moving forward with. And really looking to implement a design making process that's looking to seek out, um, uh, sorry, to design out uh, environmental impacts. And we're working hard on that and, and um, I think we've been quite successful in actually avoiding those key features. So for example, um, we avoided things such as ancient woodland, listed buildings and registered parks and gardens, as well as triple SIs. Uh, in terms of flooding, um, so we're looking to obviously to mitigate any project related risks and link to climate change um, and considering what changes in the future might be from climate related um, changes. Um, and we're working again hard in this area. Um, I've actually established regular ongoing uh, engagement with the Environment Agency uh, to share information, data that they have and we have, and modelling as well to ensure that we understand what the impacts may be, uh, and working with the Environment Agency on various issues such as water crossing design, um, construction methodologies and so on. Uh, next slide please. Uh, in terms of sustainable energy for our trains, um, although we haven't got a commitment to electrifying the railway, we will need to ensure that what we do aligns with, with relevant policy uh, and legislation um, and net zero carbon efforts. Um, and you know, it goes back to net zero carbon um, information that I shared uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, but also it's worth noting in 2018, the government challenged the rail industry to produce a vision for uh, the removal of all diesel only trains from the network by 2040. And so we're exploring options for the long term fleet and how we can introduce new and emerging technologies to support that. Uh, surveying protected species. Um, we've been going through um, an extensive survey program uh, last year and ongoing this year. Uh, we started originally back in May of last year um, and covering surveys across a range of different um, uh, disciplines, but ecology has been key. Um, so surveys around uh, bats, phase one habitat surveys to understand what we've got out there uh, and bat surveys also been key for us too, as well as some non-intrusive heritage surveys. So we're doing a lot of work on surveys at the moment and we'll continue to do so. Uh, managed impacts from farms and land holdings. Um, we're looking to avoid areas with the highest grade agricultural land where we can. Um, and also looking for ways to reduce impact of the railway on agricultural practices and soil resources. And so we want to understand how best to minimise those impacts. Um, and so we will have a programme of conducting uh, what we term farm business interviews with landowners and tenants, really to understand how the land is used and how we can consider that as part of the design process to minimise impact. Uh, and finally, and, and by no means, um, at uh, least uh, really thinking about impacts on the community, trying to eliminate, minimise and mitigate disruption, um, particularly, you know, in relation to adverse impacts on health and quality of life, to so consider a range of aspects, including sound, noise, vibration, um, as well as public rights of way uh, and land and property requirements and so on. Um, so I hope that gives a bit of flow. Sorry, Ian. Sorry. No, sorry, you carry on. Oh, OK. Um, and then we've picked up some sort of uh, questions and themes coming through. So I was just going to touch on on some of those really um, as the, the final element of this uh, environmental update. Um, so you can provide examples of how the line would benefit the environment. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I think <clears throat> it's important to note that, <coughs> excuse me, um, environment very much has been at the forefront of our thinking. We've worked very hard to try and avoid the most significant environmental um, features and assets that I mentioned earlier. Um, and really want to change the environment for the better. So we're looking, as I mentioned, to live a biodiversity net gain and also net zero carbon. But also we're looking carefully and, and working hard to explore other opportunities to enhance uh, the natural and historic environment. Um, for example, looking at historic environment assets and how through careful and clever landscaping we might be able to enhance the setting of some of those assets. Uh, moving on to the second question, uh, related to uh, traction power, 
Um, I'm happy to pick this up, Will, but did you want to pick it up or will I run through it? Oh, let me let me just jump in on this one, Michael. Yeah, look, you know, um, we are, you know, we are still doing some work on what the right traction power uh, is. You know, I think we've been really clear, or I hope we've been really clear, if not, I'll try and be clear this evening, that um, our ambition is to be a net zero carbon railway. Um, whilst it is true that to open the first section between Oxford and Milton Keynes um, as quickly as we possibly can, we are putting in an interim fleet of rolling stock. One of the reasons for that is to give us the time such that by the time we open the whole Oxford to Cambridge railway line, we can have actually you know, done the work to, to get the right long term traction uh, for this railway. And we're looking at a, quite a number of different options for that, um, you know, so that we fulfill our net zero carbon um, ambition. Um, so we're not committing yet to full overhead electrification, but that's because there may be a battery uh, electric hybrid solution, which means we don't need quite as many of the gantries that we know people find have a negative visual impact. So we are genuinely looking at what is the best, most cost effective, um, least impactful way of delivering a net zero carbon railway. So no guarantee on the precise form of a low carbon railway just yet, but um, that is our ambition and we're, we're looking at the options uh, for, de for delivering that. Um, but we certainly don't envisage that this will be a diesel railway when we open from Oxford to Cambridge. Thanks, Will. Um, and probably worth just um, finishing up on that particular point that there'll be more information. This is obviously a non-statutory consultation on the fact that uh, this is a non-statutory consultation and it's part of a process. There will be a future statutory consultation and during that we'll bring a lot more information forward in terms of um, our, our traction power and our approach to that. Uh, so moving on to the next question, when are we going to share uh, information on environmental surveys? Well, as I mentioned, we've been doing extensive surveys over last year and that's continuing this year um, to identify really the environment we're working within, but for example, to identify the presence of protected species. Um, and yes, that will continue this year and into future years as well, actually. Uh, now, survey results can be requested by landowners. So if we're actually doing surveys on a particular property, that landowner can request those survey results and we'll provide them to them. Um, we'll then present our understanding of the environmental impacts at uh, the future statutory consultation and we'll do that in the form of a preliminary environmental information report. And then full details um, will be uh, provided in the environmental statement that reports the results of our environmental impact assessment and that environmental statement will be available um, as part of the DCO application and include full information on our surveys. And finally, uh, in terms of mitigations to uh, protect uh, the bat colonies in Wimpole Woods, a uh, special area of conservation, um, there are a small number of uh, known Bible style bat colonies in Cambridgeshire, including the Wimpole Everston Woods, a um, special area of conservation, um, which is located within our preferred route option area. It's about three or four kilometres from the emerging route alignments between Bedford and Cambridge. Um, now, the alignments we've identified uh, don't directly affect the woodlands in which the bats are currently known to roost. Uh, in relation to the areas where the barbastel bats uh, may forage or, or commute as in travel, we have been carrying out um, extensive surveys, which again are continuing this year to provide a more detailed picture and, and in fact a detailed picture of the behaviour of those bats and the popula population of them living near or along, alongside the route. Um, and based on those results, where there is a possibility of the lion affecting their habitats, uh, our design would look to include measures that have successfully um, mitigate those impacts elsewhere. So, for example, creating large and unlit culverts, underpasses or green bridges, which allow bats to pass safely from one side of the new railway to the other. We we'll also look to provide enhancement measures such as uh, new improved foraging habitat, and commuting routes. Um, and additional roosting opportunities, including, for um, example, boxes um, known to be used by barbastel bats. Um, and I think it is worth mentioning that we are actually 
talking extensively and um, consulting with Natural England in relation to the work um, with all our survey and ecology surveys, but particularly around bats, and we'll ensure that we're working with them to agree both the surveys, but also any potential future mitigation that's required in relation to those bats. Um, I think that's probably the end of the environmental section, but um, flick on if, if we can pass on. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry, I can't remember I'm, I'm passing over to it. You're, pass it. you're passing on to me, Michael, and I'm going to field yeah. the next few questions which, which other people are going to answer. So if we go straight on to the, um, to the next slide, please. So there's a number of questions we've been asked about um, the local benefits of the scheme in this area. Um, and I'm going to ask a number of my colleagues to answer these, but I'll, we'll, we'll go through them one by one. The first question, uh, which I'm going to ask Will to answer in a moment, um, is, is what will be the benefits of this rail line uh, to the villages which experience severe detrimental impact? Uh, so, Will, would you like to say a few words on that one? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's a number of things to, to say here that you know, there will be you know, significant benefits from the rail line overall in terms of the connectivity that it provides sort of from Cambridge, uh, sorry, from Camborne and Bedford and further afield to the jobs that are being created in Cambridge and Cambridge South. Um, so, that, so there will be benefits, but I do recognise that for those people who are not immediately proximate to a station, that there, there may well appear to be fewer benefits. Uh, and therefore, you know, it is you know, the benefits are more broadly around the greater sort of economic growth and prosperity that comes to the area, the jobs that will be created, both by the delivery of East West Rail. We've already created 1,500 jobs, um, you know, at the west end of this scheme. Um, so there will be you know, jobs and prosperity created as a result of East West Rail, and we are also looking. Um, at how we work with local communities to bring greater benefits as well. So particularly looking at sort of active travel, so how we can provide, you know, things like cycle paths and walking routes and those sorts of things sort of more integrated with our scheme. So people do have better access uh, to uh, the train service and find it easier to get around the local area as well. So um, as I say, I do recognise there is disruption and for some of the villages in South Cambridgeshire, you know, not the direct benefits you would get from a station, but I hope there will still be the benefits of the prosperity and also that wider, that, that wider sort of connections as well. OK, thanks, Will. Um, there's, there's a few questions now from Paul Sparrow, who's um, uh, our, our programme manager for this section of the, the route. The, the first one, uh, relates to a point which has been raised by a, a number of people locally around the, the height of the embankments uh, that we're proposing in the area. So the question, as you'll see here, is why are we proposing uh, a 10 metre high embankment running past the village uh, and and many more rather than considering a more sympathetic solution such as a, a sunken line, I think, um, the, in the railway and a cutting, um, which would reduce noise pollution. So, uh, Paul, would you like to comment on that, please? Yes, certainly. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we're extremely uh, conscious of the fact that the, the visual and noise impact of the railway in the area is, is really important to everybody uh, and the communities in, in where this railway is going to go past. Um, and through the design process at the moment, we are at a stage where we need to be designing as a reasonable worst case what that means is that we need to be taking building or designing the railway rather so that we don't make false and over optimistic assumptions at this point in time which we then later realize we can't bring to bring to bear and so for now the railway is being designed in a way that it goes over a number of roads uh, it goes over floodplain areas and uh, minimizes the impact on those flood zones in terms of the flows of those flood zones. And we're running to um, to requirements in terms of the gradients, which means that the railway is not going to be able to change its elevation in a very um, short space of uh, or short uh, distance. And, and as such, it does mean that we have got areas at the moment where 
we have uh, sections that are 10 metres high. However, it should be noted that um, we have seen some elements uh, around in the in the press uh, about there being seven kilometres of, of wall at 10 metres high um, in this area, and that that simply isn't true. We, we do have sections at 10 metres high, but nowhere near the seven kilometres that has been stated. Um, it's important to say that this reasonable worst case that we have that we're designing to today, we are going to be looking at this in the next stage of design to see how we can make improvements. Because, as I said at the start, we recognise how important this is to people. And we will be looking at, at at certain roads to see whether or not we can put the road over the rail and see if we can bring the railway uh, closer to the ground. But I think it's important to also highlight that today's de design standards and the requirements for the railway, particularly thinking about some of the things that Michael's been talking about in terms of resilience to flooding, um, mean that we have to design things in a slightly different way these days. Uh, and another point to that is, is the use of level crossings, whereas they could be used in the past and therefore keep the roads and railways at the same level. It's, it's not an option that we, we have anymore. Um, the ORR policy is that new uh, level crossings should not be put in unless under ex exceptional circumstances. So, um, we have got sections that are quite high, but our next stage of design, we will be looking at what we can do uh, with these. Um, one final thing on, on this question is the piece of design that we have not been, that we haven't done to date, and it's something that needs to be done in, to, in the next stage, is the landscaping design, where we can look to see how we can uh, mitigate some of the visual and noise impacts going forward. And we would certainly be looking at landscape design um, as part of the overall solution of what this railway looks like to see if we can shield off some of those visual impacts. OK, thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, there's another question for you now, actually. Um, so yeah. so the, next, the, the next the next question is from a resident of Hawkston. Um, who makes the point that uh, their doctor surgery pharmacy and local shops are in Great Shelford. Um, and the question is, will the level crossing in Little Shelford still exist or will there be a bridge? And if the crossing closes, will it cut me off from my local facilities, um, which which this individual moved uh, to Hoxton to, to benefit from? Yeah, um, so at the moment we don't know for certain as to whether or not the level crossing at Hawkston would need to be closed. Um, so between Hawkston and Little Shelford. Um, the the um, key point about the closure of level crossings is it's not something that's within our power or our decision making. It's there are a set of um, uh, assessments that we must follow for each level crossing and there are thresholds at which point it is determined that level crossings would need to close. We are going to be carrying out these assessments in the next stage of design to see what we need to do to um, Hawkston level crossing. Um, if it can stay open, it, it, it most likely will. We need to also consider the safety implications of, of level crossings. They are one of the most dangerous um, assets on the rail network. Um, and the reason why the ORR have the policies that they do today, which is to try and close as many level crossings as possible. I do, however, recognise the fact that the level crossings obviously offer the, the quickest route as the road layouts are, are set out today. Um, and so any closure of a level crossing um, is likely to have an impact on, on people's immediate journeys. Um, However, what we are certainly not doing is looking at uh, permanent severance. Um, we will look at the option of trying to put a, a, a bridge uh, in the same lo location as where the level crossing is today. However, this isn't always going to be possible depending upon um, where houses are currently located and there are 
housings on the uh, sorry houses on the west side of of the road um, both north and south of the level crossing so that is something that needs to be considered if we are not able to put a uh, a road bridge in the location we would look at a, a whether or not we could get a pedestrian or a cycle uh, bridge so keeping the active travel routes in and, and the shortest and the permanent diversion of the road and we'd look to make that diversion as short as possible um, so that people can still get between Little Shelford, Great Shelford, uh, well the, the, the Shelfords to, to Hawkston. Um, we need to do some more design work on that and we would welcome your views in terms of uh, potential um, routes should we need to um, close that crossing if you've got some ideas in the area as to whether a, where a permanent uh, radar version could be put. Okay. All right, thanks Paul. Uh, and I noticed you've, you've used an acronym a couple of times, the ORR, and just to clarify, because um, I know we use a lot of acronyms in our, in our industry, um, the ORR is the Office of Rail and Road um, and it's 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 the the government regulator that's responsible for for standards in both the the, the road and the rail sector actually. But but in addition, in rail, it's uh, it's the equivalent for the health and safety executive that you you find for most other areas of industry. So they're also responsible for safety on the rail network. So d double reason for for them having an interest in level crossings. And as Paul said, there is a there is a policy um, that the uh, ORR have had for a number of years now, which is where possible to, to close level crossings for safety reasons. And and actually in this instance, Paul, we also have the issue of the, the level of service used in the crossing means the barriers will be down for quite a large proportion of each uh, hour, doesn't it? So um, the, the, the next question continues the conversation on level crossings. I think you've probably partially answered it, but um, again for you, Paul, so elimination of level crossings will certainly not make it easier to get around within the local area, um, which is what we've just been told is your aim. So, uh, Paul? Yes, so um, again, uh, I, I understand um, where this question is coming from. It, it, it seems contradictory to, to what our aim is. However, as I mentioned before, the, the situation with level crossings and whether or not they remain open or closed, is not a decision or a, a set of factors um, that lay within our hands and, uh, and our capability of deciding uh, whether or not it, it stays open. We will merely be doing the assessment based on the additional train services that will be crossing that level crossing and, and uh, being able to then see whether or not it passes that threshold of, of the requirement for a level crossing closure. But I, I think what I would like to highlight here is that whilst it might not make it immediately easier to get around we would look at alternatives to those level crossings to make it as easy as possible um, and as stated before in all locations if if we can um, put a bridge in that would certainly be the primary option if we can't we will look at the active travel solutions in terms of pedestrian and cycle bridges which have a smaller footprint uh, to see if we can get something in there and then a permanent uh, diversion somewhere else and possible new road um, to try and minimise that impact of the level crossing closure as much as possible. But I, I think it is really important to highlight and and I, I would imagine that most people have seen television adverts from Network Rail on recently about how dangerous level crossings really are on the network. And, and so from a health and safety perspective, um, it really is important that we get the, the safety of, of the communities right as well as that um, ease of moving around and it's that balance that we have to play with when we're when we're looking at level crossings and uh, and the impact of the additional services that we put over them so I, I hope that helps it's we're not it's 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 always a tricky one level crossing because it does offer that ease of access to places but but safety has to be paramount and that is something that is set to us not decided by us yeah all right um so paul i'm not i'm not going to ask you the next question um so the next one's for you who's uh, one of our land team um so the fi final question in this section is how much compensation do you plan to give to all homeowners in haslin field and halton um the value of our property has already decreased due to your proposals, it's likely to fall 
significantly further if uh, if you proceed with the project. So, uh, Jorn, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, firstly, I'd just like to say our priority is to avoid our negative impact, and my colleagues have have touched on the on the mitigation we'll be taking towards um, environmental and, and construction impacts. Um, where we where we may need land for our proposals, um, we will work with those landowners to keep them updated. And if we cannot avoid our negative impact, we'll ensure they get the compensation they deserve. Our pre preference will always be to reach a, a voluntary agreement with landowners, um, although we will be seeking um, powers for compulsory purchase. Um, and whether it's through a, a voluntary agreement, um, compulsory purchase or, or statutory blight notices, landowners are, are entitled to the full unaffected market value um, of their property, ignoring the effect of the scheme. Um, we'll abide by the statutory compensation code and that, that applies to land um, if uh, land that's needed permanently, um, temporarily, or, or for the loss in value of land um, adjacent to the scheme. Um, and in the case of the latter, um, that compensation may be available through what's called um, a part one claim, um, which is when uh, compensation can be claimed um, when property has been reduced in value by physical factors uh, caused by the railway. So, so that could be uh, noise, like vibration, smell or, or lighting. Um, and th there's leaflets on our websites uh, on our website which discusses this further. Um, and then, of course, for those going through hardship, uh, we are consulting on the, the need to sell scheme. Um, but I believe there's a, a slide on that a bit further on. So I'll um, go into a bit more detail on that uh, later. So um, okay. uh, I think next or oh, back to you, Ian. OK, thanks for that. Uh, and look, I'm really conscious that um, we, we're 55 minutes into this presentation, so we will try and um, move through the next bit um, as quickly as possible. But I hope everybody forgive us if we overrun just slightly on this, because I know there's still other questions to answer. Um, so the next section is around uh, the, the the northern route into Cambridge, and a number of people have raised the question, a number of questions around uh, what, why why we're not continuing to consider a uh, a route into Cambridge uh, going going uh, via the north uh, the north side of the city. Um, if we move on to the next slide, then please. Um, so I guess a few points to make. So in 2019, uh, you remember that there was a non-statutory consultation where we were consulting on route options. So the, the broad areas defined by potential routes, as you can see on the, the map actually on that slide. Um, so all five of them approached Cambridge from the south and there were reasons for that that, that were based on the engineering issues, operational issues, economics uh, and, and indeed environmental issues. And, it, and in that consultation, uh, we asked whether people felt that it had been right to prioritise routes which approach Cambridge from the south. <clears throat> and, you know, there was a mixed response. Um, a number of people did did state a preference for, for, for going into Cambridge from the north. Uh, our overall conclusion, though, based on all of the factors I've just mentioned and, you know, the, the, the general public response was that approaching Cambridge from the south was was did remain the preferable option. Um, and when we announced in uh, January 2020 our preferred route option, uh, it was based on that um, and feedback from the communities um, in in 2019 in that consultation was um, was central to that decision um, uh, uh, to, to 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 recommend route option E. So if we move on to the, the next slide, please, please. Um, so how do these two options compare? Well, um, we have we have decided to to look further at the northern route, as you'll see from the consultation documents. Um, part of the reason for doing that was that we um, we we've we've identified a number of options which uh, which would involve locating a station to the north of Camborne. So it did seem therefore logical to look at at a northern route again. Um, we we did that um, and we we did conclude a number of things. One was that. The route into Cambridge from the south remains remains the shorter distance, um, not by very much actually, by you know a couple of kilometres if that. Um, but in terms of journey time, it is a, it is a bit faster because the the railway into Cambridge from the south has a has a higher track speed 
allowed than than the route from the from the north. The other thing that that we considered was there's less infrastructure on floodplains, um, and that that means that we don't have to build as much of the railway on embankment um, and viaduct as we would do if we went further north. Um, and uh, as you know, the 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 area to the to the to the north of the A14 and around Bar Hill um, is 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 very low lying. Um, and so that means less earthworks. Uh, it may, means um, it means that less less substantial structures. Um, but the other thing that was really important for us um, was was in terms of the number of properties that would that would be affected by a northern route into Cambridge. And and you know what we've tried to do um, with each of the route options that we've looked at is to minimise the impact on people's homes, um, which clearly we we're, we're trying to avoid doing. Um, Inevitably, there there is some impact along the line of the route, but but a northern route into Cambridge would would affect between 39 and 84 uh, uh, homes uh, along along the route of the railway. We don't we don't know the, the exact number yet because it would require another level of design. But but certainly it's a significant number and it's it's a lot more than if we uh, enter Cambridge from the south. Um, and then finally, there's the the greater benefits. Um, Associated with a, with a, with a, with with the southern route, because it means we can call at Cambridge South stations, and you probably know Network Rail are intending to to build a new station to serve business parks south of Cambridge, um, and and by by entering Cambridge from the south, we can we can access that station as well, which we could do if we entered Cambridge from the north, because we could run through the central station and and out again to Cambridge South. But what that would mean is the trains would terminate there and would have to then reverse to to head back the way they'd come. Um, and there is the, the additional benefit that for routes beyond Cambridge to the east um, is far easier and would involve, you know, um, not having to reverse trains if we enter Cambridge from the south. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, and I'm, I think I've, I've covered most of this. This slide um, summarises the, the the facts that that we've concluded from from looking at both options um and in the interest of time I, I won't dwell on this one but um all the facts are available in the in the documents that are published if we move to the next slide we've got uh, a number of questions um that you've asked us about these routes the first one is have we done enough research on the southern approach to arrive at this decision and if so and the answer to which is i think we yes the answer is yes if so do you not think that alternative approaches, specifically the northern approach, should be afforded the same level of research to be to be considered in parity? And, and lots of people have asked us this question. Um, we we are continuing to do work on the southern route into Cambridge because you know we, we don't yet uh, have have all the the environmental and technical information we need to be able to design the detail of the scheme. But f from the work that we've already done, from what I've just described. We do believe that we've done enough comparative work to an equal level on both options earlier on to come to the conclusion that the route into Cambridge from the south in, in all of the ways that I've described from an engineering, environmental and economic perspective um, does still feel to us uh, like the right, the right solution. Um, the, the, the next question was around how many northern options have been proposed um, and the, the route that we've proposed uh, appears to be unnecessarily long. Well, actually, it is it is we, we did look at a number of options uh, for the northern approach in, into Cambridge. Um, the one that we've concluded here and the one we've analysed here is actually the shortest route um, that avoids the, the main sort of built up areas and, and environmentally important uh, sites. So, so actually, yes, we did look at a number of routes from the north. This one scored best and is the one that we've We've now been using for um, for for, for uh, comparative assessment. The next one is is about trains going via the new town of Northstoke, where the population is growing significantly, and also have good transport links. And you suggest that a guided busway isn't enough. Well, I guess the first thing to say is that if a new station was provided at Oakington, um, which is what some people have suggested this is still three to four kilometres away from most of the new settlement. And as you know, it's a it's a it's a big settlement. I think it's something like 10,000 houses, but you know, it's certainly a lot of a lot of people. And you know, f for a lot of people, that's a 40 minute walk. 
Um, in addition, there is uh, good public transport access to North Stowe by the guided busway, um, which is going to have services passing right through the new town, for which for a lot of people would be more convenient. And of course, um, it's well served by the new trunk road and uh, and uh, the A14 route that's just been improved into Cambridge. Um, and at the moment, just going back to the busway, there's a service into Cambridge North every uh, 20 minutes during the week, um, which at the moment uh, does have capacity to, to cope with the, the numbers of people that need to use it. Um, also, we spoke to Cambridge County Council and the developers of North Stowe themselves. They've confirmed that the public transport infrastructure provision is already in place or, or is planned indeed to, to address the housing needs. And of course, when, how, when local authorities give approval for major developments like this, they, they take account of the, um, the public transport needs these days. And so that assessment was done um, when the permission was granted for, for the development. Um, by comparison, the southern route into Cambridge provides a fast and frequent link. Um, between Campbell and Cambridge South and, Cam and Cambridge Central Station um, and provides new connections um, there around the biomedical campus. So again, that, that was factored into our thinking. Um, the, the final question on this section was whether a 10 metre embankment being built on the southern route um, would address the floodplain issue on the northern route. Well, well, yes, you know, a, an embankment would would solve the uh, would solve the flooding risk on the on the northern route if it was high enough. Um, clearly, we all know that flooding of railway lines is a is is a problem which has existed on lots of lines for for many years and and something we're trying to avoid in building a new railway. Um, so so you know the key point I guess is that the building in a flood zone is not is not desirable um, and does pre pre present a risk. Um, so, you know, if we were to build to the north of of, um, of Cambridge, wh whereas we've we, we have about 800 metres of flood zone on the southern route, if we were to build to the north of Cambridge, we're looking at nearly five kilometres. So it's a, quite a big difference. OK, so um, that, that's all the questions on the northern option. I'm going to move on now to um, and I'm going to hand back over to Yawn, in fact, uh, to talk about uh, the information that uh, is required um, for landowners. So, Jan, back to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, so just to, to give an update on what we've been doing this through this consultation period, um, we, we've been meeting with landowners um, whose land could be potentially required for our proposals. Um, uh, and really during these meetings, we've been able to explain the proposals further and the project timeframes the statutory provisions which would be available to landowners um, uh, and most importantly answering answering the questions you have. Um, we, we've also been consulting with the, with the wider community, uh, listening to your concerns and, and answering questions you have about the project and, and topics such as um, blight and compensation. Um, but, but as I kind of touched on earlier, um, we, we thank those who have provided um, feedback on our on our um, proposed need to, need to sell scheme um, and as a reminder for, for those who aren't aware um, we're consulting on this discretionary um, purchase scheme which is the need to sell scheme um, and it would provide um, support to, to those who have a pressing need to sell um, and but who are unable to um, due to our proposals uh, except at a substantially reduced rate and to answer some of the questions um, we've been receiving on the need to sell scheme um, that there isn't a set distance um, in which the scheme um, would apply uh, and if introduced it would be um, at the preferred route alignment alignment announcement point which is expected to be later this year so we we, we really value value your feedback on this so um, please get in touch and and let us know whether you think it's the right mitigation uh, there's further information on our website um, we've got a number of leaflets and um, uh, and a team who can talk you through these. Um, so please do get in, in touch through our uh, our contact channels or attend one of our our live chat events where you can um, talk to one of our experts. Um, I think I'm going to now pass to to Claire to um, just discuss the, the the consultation further. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jan. So as you all know, and I'm, I'm very aware actually we started a bit late and we're going on a little bit late, but I want to keep you too long. So I'm going to whiz through this just to say there are lots of different ways that you can get involved and that you already many people are getting involved and um, we want more people to get involved. So we've got our virtual consultation rooms. You will see them on our website full of different documents and maps available by the central table. We have live chat events where you can actually chat to through the computer. Um, so it's through the typing uh, chat bar. You can speak to our experts. And again, the details are on our website. We have a dedicated phone line for those people who aren't online or are uncomfortable in a digital space. And again, um, the telephone number is there. So if you know a neighbour or anyone in your community who um, doesn't feel comfortable online, please share this number with them and ask them to give us a call. We've got a dedicated team um, lined up to help um, answer your questions. And um, please use the feedback form, which is online, um, to send us your response to the consultation. And we need to receive that, please, by the 9th of June. Thank you. So thank you all very much for being with us this evening. You've got further um, webinars this week. And um, these are further ways in which you can respond to the consultation. And we look forward to hearing from you. So what's next? Well, basically, um, we very much would like to hear from you. But as I've said, we have got a series of um, webinars and live chat events. So um, please get in touch. Lots of information on the website. Any questions, please email us, phone us. And we look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much indeed for um, coming this evening. And apologies that we've, we started a bit late and we're finishing a bit late. Thank you very much indeed for your time. I'll say good evening from us all. Thank you.